Welcome to Just Jesus Ministry. We're going to officially begin our service. Before we begin our service, I just want to ask Pastor to come up. Pastor will be sharing the word today. And uh, ask Sister Leper to come in and pray for our pastor and for the word, please. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> thank you, Jesus. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we just um, thank you, Lord, for the word that will be shared. I pray for Tana, Lord. I pray, Holy Spirit, you just speak through him. I pray that um, you open up every heart here um, to hear and to receive the word that is being shared, Lord. Um, we pray, Lord, that the word of God um, fall on good ground. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lepa. Amen to your prayer and amen to, um, to all the prayers of the saints as well. Uh, so, back in high school... Um, we had a relay team going, yeah, and I used to be the finisher for the relay team. Um, we, we, we eventually made it to regionals, yeah, so it was, that's probably the highest, uh, you know, level of, of uh, running for Midwest and, you know, in, in the relay team. Anyways, uh, I remember this was my first time in the big league, yeah, what well, I would consider the big league. And I never really had uh, a pair of running shoes, yeah, especially the, the sprinting shoes, yeah, the ones with the spikes underneath it. I always had, uh, so my dad bought me like the old school Dunlops. Yeah, very old school, yeah. When I, when I told him that I was doing um, track and field. Yep. All good? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so when I, when I told him I was... Um, when I told him I was in the, the relay team, he said, I'll get you some shoes. And I said, yeah. And I told I explained it to him. I said, I need to get the, the ones with the spikes underneath. Yeah. Anyways, he ended up getting me the old school Dunlops with the rubber spikes underneath. And yeah, they were, they were really no good, yeah? I don't know if you guys, they're probably out of production right now because that's, that's how bad they were. But anyways, I, we ended up making it to regionals and... Uh, I was I was finishing, yeah, I was finishing. I was I was the the last runner, and I remember I was you know a bit nervous waiting on the on the bend. And as my my teammate came around, passed me the baton, I looked back because I was wondering where is this guy, yeah. And I didn't really learn how to trust, yeah. And so I I looked back for that split moment, and then as soon as I looked forward. Because all the lines, yeah, I don't know if you guys remember uh, the, the track. You've got lines that go around it, and the lines for the 100 meter stretch that go straight through. And so, as soon as I turned around, all I seen was just like all these lines, and I just got confused. Yeah? And I was like, oh, who cares? I'm just gonna run. I started running. <laughs> Little did I know, I was running in someone else's lane. Yeah? And it took that split second where I was looking back just to miss my lane. You know, if I stayed focused on the lane and I stayed and I stayed trusting in the person that was coming up behind me, I wouldn't I wouldn't have to readjust, yeah. And so obviously, um, we we made a bad placing. Uh, but the moral of the story is focus on the finish line. Yeah. And oftentimes we so so we're so used to settling for the checkpoints. When, when the finish line is up for grabs. Yeah, you guys remember the, the game Daytona? Yeah, Daytona, the, the car games, they, they still have it at the arcades and stuff like that. So Daytona, for those who had a really good childhood. <laughs> so, um, yeah, obviously it's, it's a paid game. You pay and then you drive it, yeah, and then you compete. And then every now and then, when your time goes down, you hit the checkpoints yeah, and the race is not quite finished because you've got a certain amount of laps that you have to do but you hit the checkpoint that 
gives you more time. It adds more time onto your, onto your, uh, onto your race, and then you try and finish the race. Yeah. And a lot of us, we we settle for those checkpoints. We celebrate too early instead of laboring until the end and then celebrating after you win. You see those videos of all those athletes, or you know, celebrate too early videos. Yeah, those compilations. You got a guy that's riding on a, on a, on his bike. Yeah, the Tour de France. He's riding on the bike and then he lifts his hands up and then all of a sudden another person comes through. Celebrating too early. Yeah, I'm not saying to celebrate your achievements, but I'm saying to focus on the finish as well. We're coming towards the end of our series. Yeah, and it, it, sometimes it starts to get a bit wearisome. Sometimes it starts to get, you start to uh, get a bit tired. You've got a lot of information you start to observe, uh, absorb. Yeah? And it's something that I want to encourage everyone here. Just focus. Stay focused, yeah? Don't settle for the checkpoints when the finish line is up for grabs. The finish line for us is still up for grabs. Yeah. Don't think that you have your little achievements in life. Praise God. Don't settle for those little achievements. There's a much greater goal at stake. Amen? So yeah, use, use your energy to, to get to the finish line. Don't use your energy to, to celebrate too early. Yeah. So, for those who are new, we've come through the, the book of Hebrews. We've done a series on the book of Hebrews. We're coming up to chapter 13. This is the last chapter of the book. Yeah. Chapter 10, we spoke about three responses to salvation. Does anyone remember what that was? Oh, straight out the gates. Yeah? Faith, hope, and love. Yeah. Corinthians puts it this way, yeah? And now abideth hope, uh, faith, hope, and charity, or love, and the greatest of this is love. If the greatest of this is love, it gives you all the more reason to listen in. Yeah, we spoke about faith, chapter 11, the hall of faith. We, we, we came through hope, the hope to endure, chapter 12. And now we're coming up to love. And if the greatest of these is love, all the more reason to tune in. Yeah. So... Take a more earnest heed to what we're about to hear today. What, what do I mean by take more earnest heed? It means to listen carefully. But what I don't mean, I don't mean to let go of the things that you've already learned. You guys have heard of uh, John, John 15, yeah? You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you may bear fruit. And that your fruit remains. So you're not just bearing fruit, but that the fruit that you have still remains. Yeah, you're, you're gathering faith. You're gathering hope. You don't abandon these two just to go to love. Does that make sense? I'll put it this way. Psalms 92, verse 12 to 15. It says this, you don't have to turn there, I'm reading from the Berean study. It says, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the, in the courts of, the Lord, of our God. In old age, they will still bear fruit, healthy and green, they will remain. To proclaim, he's, uh, the Lord is upright, he is my rock. And in him, there is no unrighteousness. There are a few details that, are, that the psalmist writes here. Yeah. First detail is how the righteous bears fruit. They bear it like the palm trees. They bear it like the cedars of Lebanon. Where the righteous bears fruit. It says this, planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish. You bear fruit here and then you give fruit out there. Does that make sense? And then the last one is how long the righteous will bear fruit. It says even in their old age, they will be, still be green and healthy. Green, a representation of something that is ripe, something that is young, something that is, is current. Does that make sense? So yeah, 
We've come through faith. We've come through hope. We're up to love. Gather these fruits. Understand these fruits and that your fruit may remain. Amen. So let's all turn together to Hebrews 13. If you haven't already got your Bibles open, let's go to Hebrews 13. I'm going to do a few verses today. Is that okay? Is that okay? <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right. First verse, let brotherly love continue. Simple, yeah? You've just come through Hebrews 12. It speaks about serving God. It was up Hebrews 13. Let brotherly love continue. Yeah. Minno, Philadelphia, Minno. Let brotherly love continue. Minno means to continue. There's two types of ways to continue. It means to carry on what you're already doing. If not, it means to pause. If you've stopped, then you continue on what you're doing. Does that make sense? So the assumption here is that you already know what to do. The assumption here is that you already know what brotherly love is. The author here is saying, now allow that to continue. Let brotherly love continue. Amen. In other words, if you have it, keep it going. If you don't have it, add to it. That's what, that's what the Merriam-Webster dictionary defines continue as. There's two definitions. One is to keep going and one is to add to. Add to what? Add to what you already have. Yeah? So in our English language, we have this word called love. And it's very, very, I guess I would say it's very generic. It's very faint the way you use love. Yeah, I, can, I can say I love my car. I love my wife, my family, my children. I love my job. Unless someone gives you the context, then you'd understand that those loves, the love for your car is different from your, the love for your children. True? If it's the same, then... Yeah. In the Greek language, there are eight types of love. Yeah. There's eight types of love. The first one, obviously, being agape. Agape love is divine. It's unconditional. It's the love of God to man. That's what agape is. Yeah. And for those who are new here, we're going to go through a few definitions as well. Yeah. Next one is eros. Can anyone guess what Eros is? Wicked love? It can be. It can be wicked love. Eros is actually the, the god of love in the Greek. That's where they get the word Eros from. It's romantic love. Yeah, so it can be interpreted as wicked, depending on the context. Romantic love. It's, it's the uh, intimate love, you know? One of a uh, husband and wife. That's what Eros is, yeah? That's where we get the, word, the, the English word for erotica. Philia is the next one. Does anyone know what philia is? We just come from it. Brotherly love, yeah. Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. Yeah. So philia is brotherly love. Storge, familiar love. Yeah, Storge is, is a mature love. It's a, it's a love of the parent to the child. Amen? Philautas or Philautas means self-love. Phil is love and Autos is yourself. Yeah? Pragma, Pragma love, that's number six. Uh, six. Pragma means enduring love mature love it's one that endures past the honeymoon phase it's something that holds on yeah that's enduring that's pragma love ludus playful love flirtatious love and you've got this one i pray that we don't have it it's mania yeah mania pretty much explains itself obsessive love we get the word maniac from. You're a maniac. You're obsessive. 
Yeah, put an AVO on you. That sort of mania. Yeah? So you've got eight different types of love. We're going to go through and I'll, I'll give you guys an opportunity to guess what sort of love the scriptures is talking about here. Yeah. So the first one, we covered it already. Philia. Yeah? Let brotherly love continue. Amen? So the next sort of love, I'll, I'll give you guys an opportunity, but let's read it. Verse 2, it says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember them that are in bonds, as bond with them, and them that suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. But this, this is a love that encompasses outside of yourself. Yeah? Because only with this love can you can you serve other people. So remember, it says, be not forgetful. The first commandment is be not forgetful. Yeah? The assumption is that you already know. We spoke about uh, in the last session about avoiding chores. Integrity is not just in your actions, but what you know as well. Yeah? So if you know what to do, then do it. That's integrity. But if you know what to do and you're dodging it, then you lack integrity for yourself. Yeah? So be not forgetful. Be not neglectful. Not oblivious. Not uncared for. That's what it means. Yeah? In other words, be on the ball. The phrase to be on the ball means to have a balance or foresight to identify and fulfill needs before they are needed. The reason why I want to explain that is because oftentimes we understand what to do, but oftentimes we allow ourselves to fall behind the ball. Yeah? Even at home, you already know clean your room. You already know wash the dishes. You don't have to be told unless you're like six, five, six. Uh, well, to be honest, the generation that was back in the days, they were washing dishes at five and six. I know because I was one of them. Yeah? It sets you up for life. And we spoke about this stuff, yeah? In, in the last session. So it's very important for us to be not forgetful. To entertain strangers. For thereby some, are, some have entertained angels unawares. You know when you come past the stranger, you may be encountering someone, somewhat of an angelic being. You might be tested. I've heard so many stories of so many people that go out and help strangers and then they turn around and the stranger is gone. They're like, where was this guy? I, I just helped him. Homeless person on the streets. I just helped him. Turn around to say, God bless you, goodbye or whatever. And the, the homeless person is gone. Do you guys remember the story of the pastor that dressed up as a homeless guy and sat outside the church building? Yeah, there was a pastor that dressed up as a homeless guy and sat outside the building. And so many people, just in time for the church service, yeah? So many people walked past. Some gave him money. Some told him to get away. Yeah? Just before the service starts, the homeless man walks to the front. Walks to the front of the altar. Takes all his gear off. And to the surprise of the congregation, it was their pastor that was sitting there. Jesus says this, to the least of these that you've done it to, you've done it to me. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. Because some have entertained angels unknowingly. Yeah? Remember them that are in bonds. It goes along the same lines as well. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. Be sympathetic. Be able to relate to them. A more biblical word is this, have compassion. An example of this is when Jesus fed the 5,000, yeah? The disciples said, send them away. He said, no. Jesus understood that they're hungry. I want to feed them. He had compassion on them. Yeah? So remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and then that suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Yeah, be sympathetic to people. Relate to them. Understand them. Yeah. It doesn't mean to join them. It just means to understand the circumstance. Does that make sense? 
So yeah, what's that sort of love? Yeah, nailed it on the head. Agape love. You think about all the, the eight loves that I shared with you guys, yeah? Agape love is the only love that enables you to do this. It's the only love that enables you to serve strangers. Because oftentimes we only serve ourselves, our families, our friends. Jesus puts it this way. If you greet your brethren only, what difference are you from the publicans? If you serve only your brethren, what's the difference between you and someone else that's a sinner? He says, Didn't, doesn't God send the rain on both the just and the unjust? Yeah? So yeah. Do not be forgetful. Understand and stay on the ball. Whenever you encounter, see that as an opportunity. Yeah, you guys heard of the story of the pond, the pond full of milk. I explained a little bit. Of, yeah, pond full of milk. So there was a man that um, there was a king, and he got all his workers to build a pond, no, not build a pond, but dig up a hole and fill it up with water. Basically, do a pond up. Yeah. So they constructed a pond. And then before the sunset, he commanded every man to bring a cup of milk to fill up the pond. And by the morning, we're going to have a pond full of milk. Yeah. One man, he decided, you know what? I'm just going to fill up my cup with water. I'm just going to take it down to the pond. No one's going to know because it's dark, right? No one's going to know. So he filled up the the cup with water and he took it down to the pond and he poured it in. You know, obviously it will mix up with the rest of the milk and no one would know. The next morning, the villagers woke up and to the king's surprise, he walks down to the pond and it was full of water. Yeah? When it uh, this is the moral of the story. When it comes to serving, do not think that others will do it. Rather, do it yourself. When it comes to serving, it's something that we... We often hold to ourselves, yeah? It starts from you. And if you don't do it, no one else will. You guys heard that quote, be the change that you want to see in the world? Yeah. I don't know who quoted that, but it's a good, it's a good saying. Be the change that you want to see in the world. Amen? So the scriptures also show us a blessing. The blessing and not the reward. So Ephesians 6, 6 and 8, uh, 6 to 8, it says this, Not with eye service as men pleases, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing whatsoever thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Yeah. So that's the reward. That's the reward. The blessing is that you give. Oftentimes we think blessing is receiving. Do you remember what Apostle Paul said about Jesus? He said, it's better to, it's, be, it's more blessed to give than to receive. So that's the blessing. The blessing is that you give. The reward comes elsewhere. It comes from God. Does that make sense? So hospitality, I want to speak about this because it's something that's very important for a Christian. Hospitality is a virtue. It's not a place. Don't wait for people to come over to your house and then serve them. You can serve them here. Hospitality is a virtue. Does that make sense? We all know that church is not a building. Church is the gathering of the saints. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. That's church, right? If church is not a building, then hospitality is not a house. Does that make sense? Hospitality is a virtue that you show everywhere you go. There's many times where you got brothers and sisters that will go elsewhere and they serve elsewhere and it's apart from their house. Why? Because it's not situated in the place where they live. It's actually here. They serve from the heart, not from the home. Does that make sense? 
Romans 12, verse 10 to 13. I'll read it from the Berean, yeah? It says this. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Outdo yourselves in honouring one another. Do not let your zeal subside. Keep your spiritual fervour. Serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction. Persistent in prayer. Share with the saints who are in need. Practice hospitality. Yeah. So the second challenge is to serve. Like John said, here we have agape love. So we'll turn back to Hebrews 13. We'll go to verse 4. Hebrews 13 verse 4. It says this. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Now the author turns his focus on a type of love that is sometimes misunderstood, misconstrued, and oftentimes it's abused as well. So there are two of the eight loves here that I mentioned earlier that have boundaries. Two of the eight. This is one of them, Eros. Yeah. Eros is one of the loves that needs to have a boundary. God is very clear that the, um, in the Bible that love is reserved for marriage. Yeah. And Paul warned young believers against succumbing to immorality. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 8 to 9. This is what it says. So I say to those who aren't married and to widows, it's better to stay unmarried just as I am. But if they can't control themselves, they should go ahead and marry. It's better to marry than to burn with, with lust. Burn with passion in the NIV, burn with lust. Yeah. This is not condemning marriage at all. It's actually saying that there has to be a boundary for this eros love, this romantic love. Does that make sense? It's very interesting. I find it very interesting that the Bible uses the imagery of burning. It uses the imagery of fire to sort of explain love. And it's a very good analogy. Yeah? The same fire that is honorable and undefiling to God is the same fire that God condemns and judges. Listen to that, yeah? The same fire that caused husband and wife is the same fire that caused whoremongers and adulterers. Same fire. So what's the difference? The difference is the place. Yeah. I remember one pastor, he, he uses this analogy. The same fire that warms the fireplace is the same fire that can cause havoc throughout the house when it's used in the bedroom. Yeah. So Eros is a love that ought to have boundaries. And God designed it so it's used in the bonds of marriage. Same way you'd use a fire, you'd use it in the fireplace or on the stove, and you wouldn't use it anywhere else. Does that make sense? Verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that we may be bold, uh, so we, that we may boldly say, "The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me." The next type of love, the next type of love, also has boundaries. You guys remember th what that one was? Not the playful one. Hey. Eh? Mania. The next type of love is mania. Yeah? Uh, yeah. It's obsessive love. When you're obsessed about someone or something. Yeah? Obsessive love is both destructive and intrusive. And although the Bible doesn't directly refer to this love, there are many times it describes this love. Yeah? Let us turn to... A story in 2 Samuel 13. For those who, 
who have read the Old Testament, they, they probably know where I'm going with this. Second Samuel 13, verse 1 to 22. There's a lot of... There's, there's a lot of things that we can unpack in this scripture, but I want to focus on something, yeah? Second Samuel 13, verse 1 to 22. Say amen when you're there. Amen? Okay. Let's go. So it says, Now David's son, Absalom, had a beautiful sister named Tamar. And Amnon, her half-brother, fell desperately in love with her. Amnon became so obsessed with her, with Tamar, that he became ill. She was a virgin and Amnon thought he could never have her. Amnon had a very, had a very crafty friend, his cousin, Jonadab. He was the son of David's brother, Shimea. One day, Jonadab said to Amnon, What's the trouble? Why should the son of a king look so dejected morning after morning? So Amnon told him, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. That's one of the traits that you need to understand about obsessive love. Obsessive love, they play the victim. They play the depressed. Woe is me. The whole world is against me. Because why? Because I'm not getting what I want. Hmm. Yeah? He's got a cousin that comes up and well, you're the son of a king. Why are you so sad? Morning after morning. And he says, oh, because I'm in love with Tamar. Yeah? My brother Absalom's sister. Verse 5. Well, Jonadab said, I'll tell you what to do. Go back to bed and pretend you are ill. When your father comes to see you, ask him to let Tamar come and prepare some food for you. Tell him you'll feel better if she prepares it as you watch and feed you with her own hands. So Amnon laid down and pretended to be sick. And when the king came to see him, Amnon said, asked him, please let my sister Tamar come and cook my favorite dish as I watch. Then I can eat with uh, then I can eat it from her hands. Yeah. Very obsessive. Something that we need to understand. As Christians, we're not meant to counsel this stuff to encourage it. We're not meant to endorse obsessive love. We're actually meant to tell them the truth. Yeah, and Paul puts it this way. Have I now become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And this is the dilemma that Christians face every single day. When they disagree with something because the scriptures say one thing and the lifestyle say another thing and it's conflicting. They don't want to confront it. Yeah. And as you see here, a very good example of where the cousin actually endorsed what he was doing. He was actually approving it. He's saying, you know what? I know she's your half-sister, but I'm going to tell you a plan that you can get her. Yeah? Had he, had he received different counseling, it'll probably unfold a different way. Yeah. Verse 8. Sorry, verse 7. So David agreed and sent Tamar to Amnon's house to prepare some food for him. When Tamar arrived at Amnon's house, she went to the place where he was lying down so he could watch her mix some dough. Then she baked his favorite dish for him. But when she set the serving tray before him, he refused to eat. Everyone get out, Amon, Amon told his servant. So they all left. And he said to Tamar, now bring the food into my bedroom and feed it to me here. So Tamar took his favorite dish to him. But as she was feeding him, he grabbed her and demanded, Come to bed with me, my darling sister. No, my brother, she cried. Don't be foolish. Don't do this to me. Such wicked, such, such wicked things aren't done in Israel. Where could I go in my shame? And you would be called one of the greatest fools in Israel. Please, just speak to the king about it and he will let you marry me. But Amnon wouldn't listen to her. And since he was stronger than she was, he raped her. Then suddenly, Amnon's love turned into hate, and he hated her 
even more than he loved her. Keep in mind, yeah, you remember that line. It says that Amnon's love turned to hate and he hated her more than he loved her. Get out of here, he snarled at her. No, uh, no, no, Tamar cried. Sending me away is worse than what you've already done to me. Why? Because culturally, she's meant to hold her virginity until marriage. Yeah, it's very frowned upon. Until the consummation of her marriage, then she's... But because he's already taken advantage of her, she no longer has this. Yeah? So sending me away now is worse than what you've already done to me. But Amnon wouldn't listen to her. He shouted for his servant and demanded, throw this woman out and lock the door behind her. Yeah. So that's just... Um, what, I, what I find amazing about the scriptures is that it doesn't sugarcoat certain situations. Cause it for what it is. Yeah. To make sense of this is a very challenging thing. A lot of people blame God for a lot of uncertain, um, unfortunate circumstances. And they don't realize or have that understanding that there is the prince of this world. Right? The prince of darkness. Anyways, I want to go back to... I want to go back to verse 15. It says, Then suddenly Amnon's love turned to hate, and he hated her more than he loved her. Yeah? So his, his obsession caused him to swing from one extreme to another extreme. Yeah, and that's what obsessive love does. When you can't get something you love, you absolutely hate it. Yeah? There's a psychological, psychological shift of an obsessive person that causes them to express remorse in a different way. So after he raped her, he's, he was remorseful, but the way he showed his remorse was different. He went from loving her obsessively to completely hating her. Yeah? You know, there was a, there was a study that was conducted by the, the National Crime Records Bureau. 2019, yeah? The number of murdered victims was 286 in 283. So out of 286 rape victims, 283 of them were murdered. Think about it. Obsessive love. You went from one extreme to a complete different extreme. And a lot of these, a lot of these people that commit these crimes... They go from stalking for days and days and weeks and months of these people, and then they fall into it, and then they they completely turn the other way. Yeah. They go from loving them, then after the act, they murder them. 283 out of 286. It's very close, yeah? It's crazy how the scriptures talk about the dangers of covetousness. And so this, even though this love, I didn't mention this love earlier because I just mentioned the eight generic loves, the general loves. This love, covetousness, is a love that's, that should be, should be up there as well. It's, it's the word in Greek, philaguros. Yeah? Philaguros is a love for mammon. It's a love for material things. You see here in verse 5, it says, Let your conversation be without philagoros. Let it be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. Because he's already said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Is that enough? When God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, would that be enough for you? Yeah? So he's already said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And we reply with this bold statement that the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man will do unto me. Yeah? So mania is an obsessive love. And the root of mania is simple. Philotos. Self-love. Yeah? There was a South African uh, theological seminary that referenced one of the main causes of mania or obsessive love is narcissism. 
2 Timothy 3, 3 verse 2, it says this, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Lovers of their own selves. In other endings, men shall be selfish. Ultimately, what it's trying to sh show us here is that men in the last days shall be narcissistic. They'll be caring about themselves. And if you read the whole context of 2 Second Timothy 3, it's not talking about the people out there. We already know that's their traits. The people in the world. Self-loving. Self-preserving. 2 Timothy 3 is actually talking about the people in the church. Very scary. Yeah? For men shall be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Yeah, and so forth. And verse 7. Going back to Hebrews 13. It says this. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. Now the author turns his, his attention to the believers to uphold this responsibility. He says, you uphold your responsibility of fact-checking your leaders and the same also to the leaders. Yeah, Paul has a similar tone given to Timothy. First Timothy four sixteen, he says, "Is keep a close watch on yourselves and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so you will save both yourself and your hearers." Does that make sense? So the responsibility is given to everyone. Many believers neglect the responsibility of fact checking their leaders. Not only what they say, but also what they do. And it should be a standard among all Christians. We should be able to confront one another with our problems. We should be able to correct one another, rebuke one another. That's how the Christian life is. Iron sharpens iron. It's not just in fellowship, but it's in correcting the things that go astray. Does that make sense? Oftentimes we use iron sharpened iron just as a, as a scripture of encouragement. What about using it as a scripture of correction? What about using it as a scripture of confrontation? What about using it as a scripture to save someone else? Yeah? So there's, there's things called... Um, there's, there's a job that people have that they appraise valuable items. Yeah? You guys probably seen the... Uh, those TV shows like, you know, uh, bidding wars. you got those bidding wars where they get items out of containers or whatever they bid on and then they take it to get appraised. Yeah, and oftentimes the valuable item can come back counterfeit or it can come back genuine. Depends on the person that's appraising it. Yeah, the appraisal is someone that rectifies or someone that um, calculates whether something is genuine. In the same manner, we're meant to appraise each other. Does that make sense? In the same manner, we're meant to appraise whether what we're doing is spiritual, whether what we're doing is, is edifying, whether what we're doing is wholesome. That is what appraising is. Does that make sense? And as a Christian, our final authority is the word of God. Amen? You know what's interesting is that the author of Hebrews, he says, remember them that have rule over you. And he says, hold them to the standard. And then he says in the very next verse, he says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's not just a phrase that feels good that rolls off the tip of your tongue because you're a Christian. It's the standard that he's setting. He's saying Jesus is not changing. If Jesus is not changing, then so should the doctrine and so should the leadership. Does that make sense? And it flows straight into this narrative. He says, hold them that are rule over you and make sure they're, they're, they're true to the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation, remembering this, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, Paul expresses a similar sort of attitude to this. 
He says, if another gospel is preached, if another Jesus is preached. Yeah? Verse 9. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. Not with meats, which we have, uh, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Yeah. So for those who are wondering if it's all about relationship and doctrine, uh, it's no big deal. I think this scripture puts it to argument, yeah. Sorry, I think this scripture puts the argument to rest. A loving parent shows storge. Storge is familial love. Is a love of a parent to a child. No parent would ever want their child to be deceived. Yeah? And so this scripture in verse 9, it's actually encouraging critical thinking. It's also encouraging sound thinking. Listen to it carefully. Be not carried away with strange and diverse doctrines. It shows one thing. It shows that you ought to know your word. If you think you can go out there in the world and be able to discern a false doctrine from your own doctrine without knowing your word, then you're fooled. Yeah? The importance of knowing your word. Don't be carried away with diverse and strange doctrines. For it is good uh, for it is a good thing that your heart be established with grace. That's our covenant. It's a good thing that you're founded in this covenant. The covenant of grace. And then it says this, not with meats. Meats representing the Old Testament rituals. Meats representing the Old Testament do's and don'ts. Meats representing the law. It says it's a good thing that your heart be established in grace and not with meats which have not profited them. You think about it. There are certain meats that allowed the Old Testament, they, they were allowed to use. And there are certain meats that they abstain from. But the Bible says it doesn't profit them. So establish, establish yourself in grace. Amen? Furthermore, I think Paul, he uses, he, he sort of has the same tone. First, Galatians 1 verse 6 to 9. Galatians 1 verse 6 to 9. He says this. Galatians 1 verse 6 to 9. Sorry, I'll read it from the ESV. It says this. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some of you who trouble, some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you have received, let him be accursed. So don't be carried away with strange doctrines. Don't be carried away with so many different new Christianities. There's a new form of Christianity called deconstructing Christianity. It's almost like the it thing now. I think that's something that we need to be aware of. Paul actually rebused the church of Gal uh, Galatea for this. He says, you foolish Galatians, who tricked you into believing those doctrines? Who tricked you into believing that you're made perfect by the flesh? And not by the spirit. Who tricked you? You think about it. If Paul was your pastor. He, and, and he was uh, facing this dilemma today. Imagine his, his anger towards that. Because he was a spiritual father. Amen. Paul acted as a spiritual father to those who were infants under him. Yeah. And it's, it's a burning sensation within Paul. That his, that his children are deceived. And it's something that he had to address with the church of Galatea. So who bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you? Yeah. 
So you establish yourself in grace. Verse 10. We're going back to Hebrews 13, verse 10. It says, We have an altar whereof they have no right to serve. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. Yeah. So ultimately, Paul's, uh, sorry, the, the author here, he's going to start comparing the Old Testament to the New Testament. The author here is, is basically comparing Samsung to iPhone. Yeah? Right? All he's doing is this. He's showing the Old Testament and then he's showing the upgrades to the New Testament. Yeah? iPhone's a bit behind with the uh, charging port, but... <laughs> they're a bit behind, so they're in like the Old Testament, Yeah? <laughs> So the writer now makes in a, a wise comparison, the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's almost like he's saying, we have an answer to your, your rituals and your testimony. We have an answer to all your practices in the Old Testament. Because remember, what did they have in the Old Testament? They had sacrifices. They had altars. They had ceremonies. They had all these things. Now, the writer here is, is going to introduce something to us. Because oftentimes, as humans, we have this, this pull towards the Old Testament, yeah? Even though we've come to grace, but we want to see the work of our own hands. So we want to go and gratify ourselves by keeping all these rules and Passovers and things that are already done away with. Yeah? I want to try something with us. Yeah. I want to try something called, so do we. Yeah, I'm going to say a few things. And I want you guys to say it from your chest, yeah? So do we. Yeah, this is, this is our covenant. So obviously, I'm speaking about the Old Testament, yeah? So I say, if Israel has altars, what do we say? So do we. Yeah? You got it, Robbie? So Israel has altars. Israel has meats. Israel has sacrifices. Israel failed. No, 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 no. <laughs> that was a trick one. That was a trick one. Yeah? <laughs> I, I want to I wanna compare the Old Testament to the New Testament. Because this is what the, the writer is doing. Verse 10, he opens it up with this comparison. He says, we have an altar. Yeah, you might have an altar. Yeah, we do too. You might have uh, sacrificed meat. Yeah, we do too. We have a sacrifice that's already done. See, the altar in the Old Testament, there were burning wood, yeah? Brazen altar. Sign of judgment. The altar in the New Testament is what? The cross. That's the altar where we laid our meat on. Yeah? Remember, you got four corners on the brazen altar that were dipped with blood. Four corners. We've got four corners on our altar that's dipped with blood too. It says, verse 10, it says, we, it says, we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. Because remember, the burnt offerings that they offered back in the days, they'll burn it and then they'll eat it. Yeah? This was a fellowship offering. Yeah, they, they burn the meat and then they'll eat it and they'll pass it on to the next family and the fellowship over it, yeah? The, the, the Bible here says, we have an altar, but they have no right to eat here, which serve the tabernacle. Those who serve the tabernacle, those who fall under the law, and we, we call them, we, uh, we call them the, uh, there's a word that they use today called the halfway Jews. The halfway Jews. They're almost to Christ. Once you come to Christ, yeah, come in, we can eat this meat together. Does that make sense? We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burnt without the camp. Okay. That word without the camp means outside of the camp. So there was a, an offering called the sin offering. 
In other words, it was called the purification offering. This was the only offering that after it was burnt, the meat was thrown outside the city walls and it was continued to burn there. Yeah? So they would sacrifice here inside the camp and then they'll throw all the meat outside the city walls. It says, For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, for the sin offering, just as they are burnt without the camp, it says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Where did Jesus get crucified? Outside the city walls. He was the representation of our sacrifice. The meat that was offered for sin and thrown outside the city walls, our sacrifice actually began outside the city walls. He was offered outside the city walls. He was burnt outside the city walls. That he might sanctify the people with his own blood. Crazy, yeah? Now this is the exhortation of the author. Verse 13. Let us therefore go forth. Unto him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. And many, many of us, especially in today's society, yeah, humans in general, have this willingness or this desire to belong. I want to belong with the majority. I want to belong with the cool gang. I want to belong with all those guys that are in right now. Verse 13 says this, our sacrifice is outside the gate. Let's go out there. Let's go join him outside the gate. Let's go suffer his reproach. Just like he was reviled on the cross, let us be reviled too for his name's sake. Just like he was persecuted, let us be persecuted too for his name's sake. Yeah. And then it says 14, for there, for here, have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. You know, a, a very good indication that the bus driver, and a very good indication to the bus driver that he should stop to pick you up is that you're waiting at the bus stop. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty good indication, yeah. And even if you, you're not ready to jump on the bus, they'll still stop anyways. Yeah. Outside the city walls, outside the city gate, that's our bus stop. There, we don't continue with the city that's, that's here now. We seek one to come. We're waiting the city to come. That's where we should wait for the bus. Amen? Amen. So yeah, many insist that you keep the law, keep the practices of the law. But I'm here to encourage us all that we have our own practices. We have our own altar, we have our own meat, and we have our own sacrifice. And it's all outside the city walls. Amen? 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16 to 18. I'm reading it from the NLT. It says this, And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, listen to this. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things and I will welcome you. And I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. In the book of Corinthians, the Lord implies a new relationship and a new position. Right. Hebrews 13, it says, let us go forth outside of the city camp outside of the city walls let's go there because that's where we don't continue with the city and we seek one to come corinthians has the same tone he says come out from among them come out from the, from among the unbelievers don't share in their filthy things and i will receive you remember the relationship between god and man was just that in the old testament it was god oh sorry it was it was people it was god and it was people right God all the way up there and people all the way down there. There was such a, a chasm between them. The Lord introduces us to a new relationship. He says, come out from among them. I'll receive you. 
your relationship is no longer God and people, although we do recognize him as still like God, your relationship is now father, sons, and daughters. Like this. You've got so many religions today, you know. The closest relationship that the Muslim can have with Allah is servant and master. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you be so great, grateful that our relationship, our closest relationship with our God is father and son, father and daughter? The encouragement that Paul gives in Corinthians is come out from among them. Yeah. John gives a similar tone as well. Revelations 18 verse 4, it says this. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of their sins, of her sins, and ye receive not her place. So revelation implies this, a separation from their association so that you don't have to take part in the portion of their punishment. Does that make sense? So I'll do two more verses, verse 15 and verse 16, and I'll get the uh, worship team up as we, as we finish off with these two more, more verses. Hebrews 13, verse 15 to 16. It says his, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Yeah? They have sacrifices, so do we. They offer meats. What do we offer? The fruit of our lips. It says, by, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips. Your thanksgiving, your praise, your worship. That's your sacrifice. No longer behind the, uh, behind the strenuous task of bringing your, your lamb to get slaughtered or bringing your, your bull to, to offer. You're no longer offering these sacrifices anymore. You picture year after year, offering animals year after year, making sure that this animal stays pure and clean for the rest of the year so I can offer it for my sins. Yeah? The Bible says, to him, let's offer the praise unto God, which is the fruit of our lips. You know, Lanu shared it today, that God gets all the glory. Yeah, we're here to glorify him. We were made for his worship. We were made for his praise. Let's offer him what he what belongs to him, which is the sacrifice of our lips. And the reason why it labels it the sacrifice of our lips is because it takes effort to open your mouth and sing praise to him. It takes effort. It's very simple for us to be like humble Christians. Ah, oh, I'm just humble in the presence of God. Let's open our mouths and worship him. Because I guarantee you, when it comes to watching your favorite game or your favorite show, we're very animated. What about praising God? Are we just as animated? Are we just as loud? Are we just as, as, as vibrant and alive in worshiping God as we are when we watch our own favorite TV shows? When we're cheering on our favorite team? Yeah? By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name but to do good and to communicate communicate in the context means to fellowship to do good and to continue to fellowship for with such sacrifices god is well pleased with these sacrifices god is well pleased keep in mind this keep in mind this guys god was not God was not pleased with bulls and goats. He was not pleased with that. You remember that from the Old Testament. Right? The blood of bulls and goats. You, wouldn't, you didn't desire that. But you look at the, the comparison here. It says, you offer the sacrifice of your lips. You do good. And you fellowship. You communicate. With these sacrifices, which require effort. With these sacrifices, God is well pleased. 
How amazing is that? Takes me back to verse 9. Establish yourself in grace. Don't be carried away with all these diverse doctrines, strange doctrines. Yeah. Involve yourselves in the offering of meats which didn't profit them that they were involved in it in the first place. But let us offer the sacrifice of our lips. Think giving thanks to God. Amen.